Um, it is my pleasure. I'm super excited to get to introduce our first speaker today. Um, this is somebody that um, I know really well and has been a really great mentor to me and is a society to cure of mine as well. So this person is a chemical engineer turned cancer biologist, finally turned neuroscientist. So he got his bachelor in chemical engineering from CU Boulder. Then he decided to switch fields and go into cancer biology at Princeton, where he got his PhD. And it was there that he started studying epigenetics and gene regulation as they apply to cancer. So when it came time for his gold start, he decided to switch fields in GAD and joined neuroscience, which um, he had never looked back and joined the dark side. Um, and he really applied this expertise in epigenetics and then molecular biology, excuse me, but the two questions for how the brain works. And with uh, his postdoc mentor, Dr. Ted Evil um, at Penn, he really uh, pioneered the field of neuroepigenetics. So in 2006, he started his lab at UC Irvine, one of these bad sense. The lab invites on um, cutting edge molecular biology and really sophisticated behavior to try to understand how epigenetic changes drive persistent changes in behavior. Um, so right now, he's the chair of the Department of Neurobiology and Behavior at UC Irvine. He also is the director and founder of UCI TAN, the Center for Addiction Neuroscience, and really across his career, he's been incredibly successful. So he's won all sorts of awards. He recently was inducted into uh, a, as a fellow of AAAS, for example. Uh, across his career, he's been funded by multiple grants, really since his lab started, uh, and he's just been extraordinarily successful. Like I said, I, I like to look at his uh, career trajectory, and I have something to aim for. Um, so. This person is too young for me to talk about his legacy, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, but I think if you talk to anybody who knows this person um, for more than five minutes, one of the first things that comes up is how excellent he is at mentoring. Um, but the people who train in his lab are really successful and go on to have really successful careers. So just at this feeding, I think there are five of us who were in his lab who are now still at academia, but there are also scientists in industry or people in teaching focused careers. And what I can say is this person is really good at using all the tools and the cloud at his disposal to help you get where you need to go. So as being fan vault, when I was writing my K99, um, he had just undergone a major eye surgery. And instead of just letting me submit it as it was, um, he actually had me come over to his house. So we could go through all of the comments point by point. So he really does everything he can to help elevate his trainees. Um, and I think, you know, you don't have to take my word for that. I think his other trainees would say the same thing. Um, so I know personally, I owe much of my success to him and I wouldn't be here today without his constant guidance and support and willingness to answer my phone calls to the day still I have a question. Uh, the soul Twit app, um, is my great honor to introduce my mentor and now my friend, uh, Dr. Marcella Wood. Please, I'm your Thank Jane, I don't even really know what to say. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Uh, it's hard to get started another talk after that, but thank you. Um, and Mike needs for choosing the music. <laughs> that was fun. Uh, and, and I'd like to really thank Mike and Manuela for everything that they have uh, put together here for the community. Uh, this meeting uh, is extraordinary. What they've done for the CL Live is extraordinary. What they do for science, education, and training is extraordinary. And, we can have a round of applause for Mike Redlow, please. Appreciate everything you oh, do. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, some uh, kind of a bit of a new direction of the lab and some old stuff as well, and trying to bring me into all sorts of stuff, and we'll see how this goes. Uh, so in the lab, the main focus is trying to understand how epigenetic mechanisms give rise to stable changes in cell function and how those stable changes in cell function then alter long-lasting forms of plasticity and ultimately persistent changes of behavior. And we're interested in, in that realm with regard to long-term memory, addiction, aging, and neurodegenerative disease. And so 
when I first got into epigenetics, this was when I was a graduate student in the cancer field, and a lot of folks in the cancer field had all of a sudden started focusing on cancer mechanisms. My own work then had uh, stumbled into those mechanisms. And in, in neuroscience, it hadn't quite hit yet, and that's why I switched fields. Um, it was another huge challenge trying to understand what epigenetics brings to the table beyond gene regulation. I'll get back into that. And so the term was uh, coined by Conrad Waddington in 1942, and a lot of people put this uh, quote up, uh, the genes of the genotype bring about phenotypic effects. And it was try, in a way trying to understand how developmental patterning occurs. But really at that time, epigenetics was kind of a dirty word, and anything that didn't fall under or normal genetics got swept under the rug of epigenetics. And, and so to give it historical context, um, in 1910, that was when Thomas Hunt Morgan, Drosophila Genetics, um, showed that a specific gene is carried on a specific chromosome. That was an enormous discovery. 1941, the one gene equals one enzyme hypothesis for arginine synthesis. Uh, 1944 was the beginning of good data that DNA might be heritable genetic material, right? Something we all take for granted, but back then, People thought really it was proteins and amino acids. More of them, more stable. That should be the, the heritable material. Uh, 1952, the Hershey Chase experiment with bacteriophage really demonstrated, no, DNA is the heritable material. And then it made a lot more sense when the structure for DNA by Watson and Crick uh, was proposed, uh, because then you were able to understand why that structure gave rise to replication that would allow for uh, heritable mechanisms. And then really it was 1958 that uh, David Nanny was um, credited for rediscovering or recoining the term epigenetics because every cell has the same genetics, but we know that liver cells will divide become more liver cells, kidney cells will divide more kidney cells, and so uh, he proposed this idea that we have a genetic basis for everything, and then epigenetics is what gives us cell fate decisions, and whatnot. So this was great, but then in modern day, it got a little confusing because it, it, epigenetics was um, being used to understand development and all, all these other things. And in 2007, uh, a, a large group of epigeneticists uh, in the yeast field, cancer, put together a book um, and kind of put together everything that everybody knew about epigenetics. And so this was one of the definitions they used. And there's no heritable term in it. In the same book, they used the, the, another researcher used the term heritable. Um, and this was one of the battles. Is epigenetics heritable? Is it not heritable? Um, and I even as of uh, about maybe five, seven years ago, there would always be an article, an opinion piece in Nature by some folks saying neuroscientists have absolutely no right to use the term epigenetics. Um, but NIH got afraid because battles were starting to begin, and so they took the middle road and said, basically, oh, everything falls under epigenetics. It's OK. It can be heritable. It can be non-heritable. It's, it's all right. Let's, let's all get together. And so in, um, in, in the early days, there were about 50 publications on epigenetics. And then 2008, uh, a lot more, currently an insane number. And really what happened was in the 1990s, mid-1990s, epigenetics was still viewed as something that was a, a way to get DNA, you know, six feet of DNA into a microscopic nucleus, um, a level of compaction that's incredible. And people thought, oh, it's a very stable and, and, and structurally persistent mechanism. It can't be used for dynamic gene regulation and things like that. And so, and, and I remember even trying to write a postdoc fellowship with Ted in his lab uh, for an NRSA proposing the idea that epigenetic gene regulation could be involved in memory, and reviewers kept coming back and saying epigenetics is, is something that's structurally stable and persistent. It cannot possibly regulate gene expression that's dynamic. Um, but then when the definitions started changing and, and the, the kind of environment started to shift, with the understanding of what was coming out in the data, um, all of a sudden everything fell under epigenetics and we swung from one way wildly to the other side. And so I'm sure all of you study epigenetics. It's all good. Um, so 
then it started to really catch on in the, in the public, but it really wasn't until Rianne Campbell, a former graduate student, ended up on the Netflix show, Bill uh, Saves, the, uh, Saves the World, uh, that's when everybody knew about epigenetics. <laughs> I'm totally kidding. Um, that was a fun moment, though. Um, so in the, in the lab, we, we've worked on two major epigenetic mechanisms. One are called histone modifications. And so there you can see circled our enzymes, CBP, HDAC3. These are histone modifying enzymes. So our DNA wraps around a nucleosome. That nucleosome is made up of histone proteins that have these tails. And the histone proteins themselves are the most evolutionarily conserved protein that we know of, but the tails are kind of loose and they get massively modified with post-translational modifications. Every post-translational modification you can think of ends up being integrated on those tails. And so you can see that little kind of tan worm going around. Those are, that's chuck full of different modifications. And so we studied how those enzymes are involved in learning and memory plasticity, et cetera. Those mechanisms work hand in hand with nucleosome remodeling complexes. And these are huge mega Dalton protein complexes that use ATP to shift nucleosomes, split them, incorporate histone variants, um, like Ian Mays has shown elegantly. Uh, and we were working on these, these were mechanisms that I worked on in cancer, and we just started working on the same exact ones in learning and memory. And so, uh, we've been on that side of, of the coin as well. And these, in all of these things work really hand in hand. And the yeast geneticist um, showed beautifully how some genes recruit one form first, then bring in the other, or vice versa, et cetera. And when I was a, a postdoc with Ted, one of my favorite experiments that we did that really kind of spearheaded some of the conceptual framework for what we started working on in my own lab was this LTP experiment where we took an HDAC inhibitor, TSA, and an HDAC inhibitor blocks histone deacetylases, so you start to open up chromatin structure. And, and that's permissive, but not instructive. And so it, you apply a TSA to slices, give a, a, a single tetanus, and you get this superinduction that stabilizes. And that becomes uh, transcription dependent. So an, a transcription independent form of plasticity automatically becomes transcription dependent and stabilizes. And so that had a lot of implications for what these mechanisms might be doing. And so when I started my lab, we wanted to know, well, if blocking HDAC activity can enhance synaptic plasticity, then what happens to memory? And so can a subthreshold learning event uh, that does not lead to short-term or long-term memory be transformed into long-term memory. And so we started working on um, object uh, recognition, object location-based uh, things, and this was actually because of a, an undergraduate who worked with Federico Bermudez Rotoni from Mexico who was doing a sabbatical in Jim McGaw's lab, and we kind of transformed some of their uh, rat uh, work in this domain to mouse which was a little harder than I anticipated. Um, but we use this task, a, a mouse is allowed to explore two identical objects. You replace one, and if the animal has a memory for the familiar object, they'll go explore the novel one. Or you can move the location of a familiar object to a new location, and the hippocampus really likes that. Uh, it is novel, and the animal will go explore that. And, and so we played around with different um, uh, aspects of this, if you train them for 10 minutes, you get this really nice discrimination index, which we uh, infer as long-term memory. If you train them for three minutes, it's kind of sub-threshold. They can't really demonstrate to you that they can discriminate anymore. And with mice, if you don't habituate them to the context, they learn nothing about the objects. Uh, rats are not like that. And in our work, we found through dozens of studies that the uh, object recognition, so recall of long-term memory for object recognition is hippocampus independent, and recall for uh, object location requires the hippocampus. And that is a bit different uh, in, in different species. And so what we did is we uh, used uh, HDAC3 flox mice uh, to be able to create a focal deletion of HDAC3 using AAV Cree. Um, delivered to the dorsal hippocampus. So you can see a nice focal deletion of HDAC3 completely missing, 
but those cells are pretty much completely fine. They have normal synaptic plasticity or early forms, normal basal synaptic transmission. Um, it's just that they, the long-term memory is quite different. And so what we did is we put these animals through a three-minute training uh, protocol. And so remember, they have a focal deletion of HDAC3 just in the dorsal hippocampus. And with three minutes of training, they have terrific memory at 24 hours. We took a different cohort of animals, and we trained them for three minutes. And then we looked a week later, and those animals also have terrific long-term memory. And so that started demonstrating that these mechanisms could really transform the information that's being encoded into a robust long-term memory. Take the same animals and put them through uh, object recognition as an internal control, and nothing happens because it's a very focal manipulation in the dorsal hippocampus. Um, and so this led to all sorts of work uh, demonstrating that HDAC3 is a, a critical negative regulator of long-term memory. It's like a molecular brake pad, and it prevents you from encoding information all the time. And, and like we've been talking about in this conference, emotional memories, those kind of glucocorticoid signaling cascades will release HDAC3 and allow you to transform uh, information into pretty robust memory. Um, but we were interested in these kind of more subtle things with respect to can you transform sub-threshold learning into long-term memory? Can you generate a form of memory that's more persistent than normal? Um, and that then started to kind of reveal how these things might be uh, related to things like PTSD, maladaptive memory processes, uh, drug-associated memories, et cetera. And because we also were working on fear conditioning, by the way, I'm going to show you very select data, not lots of controls, only one form of memory with the object location, but there's a lot more to it if you have questions. Uh, with regard to fear conditioning, the, the performance variable is freezing, and so a lot of the time we were looking at increases in freezing, and we wanted to see if we manipulated the same performance variable, could we affect a different memory process? And so with that, we got into work with um, Dr. Matt Littell sitting right there, uh, my brother from another mother. And he just had dinner with my in-laws without me. Uh, <laughs> and uh, with Melissa Malvez, right there, we were able to show that these same mechanisms can dramatically transform extinction of memory and drive extinction in a way that is persistent and blocks reinstatement. Uh, so those were, were fun studies. If you want to know where we're headed with HDAC3, um, Alyssa R Rodriguez, uh, a graduate student in lab, is showing kind of the next phase, the next evolution of this um, at her lightning talk today in a poster. So one thing that we then went on to do with uh, Janine, who introduced me, uh, who's now at Penn and has a better lab logo than uh, I do, really irks me. Um, we wanted to know what happens in the aging brain. And so she took a, a two-pronged approach to this, uh, the HDAC3 focal deletion in the flocks mice I showed you earlier, and a virus where uh, she made a point mutation in the deacetylase domain. And that was really important because up to this point in our field, um, we had manipulations where the gene was deleted, like the HDAC3 flux, or these huge chunk deletions in these enzymes. Um, and that screws up all sorts of protein-protein interactions, and you really don't know what you're studying. And I'll be the first to admit, <laughs> we don't know what we're studying when we do these things at the molecular level. And so this point mutation is really important because it maintains all of HDAC3's protein-protein interactions. You've just disabled the deacetylase domain. And so for the first time, we were able to really show with these experiments that it is the deacetylase activity, not its other activities that are important for this. And so she took 18-month-old mice, put them through 10 minutes of training, which is plenty for a young mouse, um, but sub-threshold for a, a, an older mouse. And so you can see there in the black bar, um, wild-type 18-month-old mice don't, can't really show you robust memory. But with the focal deletion, they, they now can show you great memory. Same thing happens with the point mutant. We then looked at uh, synaptic plasticity in, in these animals. Uh, this was done uh, by Aniko Kramar, a project scientist in the lab who had trained um, with Gary Lynch at UCI. And Eni was able to demonstrate uh, the effect 
uh, by these manipulations. So here's LTP, here's the enhancement with the uh, point mutant, and these are young adult mice. And there's the old, that's me, boom, LTP crashes out. Uh, and then you can restore to the adult, but you can't superinduce, likely because of the loss of synaptic density in the, in the aged uh, brain. And same thing kind of happened with the flocks mice. And so she wanted to know, well, what's happening? And so this was when we turned to RNA-seq, and the, these were days when we weren't really good at it, and, but we did it anyway, and we did a lot of RNA sequencing, and it was just so complicated, so variable but we constrained the question to, okay, what genes go up during memory consolidation, fail to go up in the aged brain, and then get rescued by a focal deletion of HDAC3? Didn't come out like we expected, but we ended up with the, these four genes, um, NR4A1, which we'd been working on, we knew it was involved in memory, that was a nice hit. Uh, PER1, I thought it was a mistake, these are old mice, it was gonna come up, they, old mice have circadian problems, Anybody here who can't sleep at night that's uh, beyond 50 knows that. EGR1, awesome gene learning and memory. And TIS22D3, GILS, which is a, another important gene that we're working on. But Janine convinced me that the PER1 was not an artifact. And, and when we went back and looked at other RNA-seq studies, it was always there. It was in our data sets from all the way back when we, even when I was a postdoc, we had come across this. Ignored it every single time. And Janine was like, no. <laughs> and she was right. And so she published a beautiful paper demonstrating that PER1 has an autonomous role in hippocampal memory function as opposed to its role in circadian rhythmicity. Uh, and, and her lab has done excellent work uh, continuing that line of investigation. But what this really led to was the, the idea that we can use HDAC3 as a tool to understand what are the genes that are really key for unusual memory regulation. And so now that's what we're doing. We're looking at these downstream effector genes. Uh, we're looking at NR42. This is work that um, Jessica Childs and uh, Vanessa Aliza and lab are working on, trying to understand the role of NR42 and HDAC3 in the medial habenula. There are these chat neurons that completely control reinstatement. Um, and so, uh, uh, Jess has a poster later today. Uh, TIS22D3, which is GILS, a glucocorticoid-induced leucine zipper, fascinating X chromosome link gene, absolutely brutal to study, um, and that's being taken on by Jake Rounds and Carlene Chin. And then PER1 hands off, uh, that's Quapis territory. And so what I've always really wanted to get to with respect to epigenetics is how does the epigenome encode information? It can encode information from our metabolism, what we eat. It can encode information from sleep, our experiences, our stress, all of that information gets uh, integrated by different signaling cascades and post-translational modifications that then alter cell function to adapt to what the animal is going through and the cell systems are going through. And the idea of how this happens was uh, pioneered by Dave Alice, who sadly passed away this year. He'd proposed the, the histone code, that there are histone modification patterns that give rise to gene expression patterns that then alter cell function for different functions. Um, there were alternative hypotheses back then also, the signal integration platform, which I kind of uh, introduced. And then there was a third one, which was just net charge effect. So there's some beautiful studies by the yeast field showing it's just net charge because the, the lysine residues are positively charged. The acetyl groups neutralize that. And when you do that, you can totally change the electronegative interactions between DNA and histones, and that can alter how you gene, uh, change gene expression uh, in, in a very large way. And so I got very interested in the signal integration platform model, and it was really using that information to understand how cells encode information and hold onto it, a kind of cellular memory. And we know that exists from um, cellular differentiation. And so um, we, we, I didn't know how to quite approach this. And uh, Ashley Kaiser, a postdoc in the lab, um, who's about to start her own lab, uh, she took a, an approach to this using exercise. And so what she did is she used these different exercise parameters. Um, and, and this was very timely with the pandemic, all this work. But uh, she trains animals, that, well, they run. They just get to run freely zero or 21 days, then uh, a week or two in 
returning back to the home cage, so sedentary behavior, and then um, a little reactivating exercise. Two days of exercise, which doesn't, isn't enough to really induce um, uh, BDNF and things like that that alter learning and memory or plasticity, and I'll show you that in a minute. Then they go through a sub-threshold uh, object location training, either three minutes or 10 minutes if we're talking about older mice, and then we test them. And so what she found was, so they're 2100, that means they got three weeks of exercise, and that in transformed sub-threshold learning into long-term memory. If they got a week off, so 2170, if they got a week off, they couldn't do it. If they took three weeks of exercise, a week off, and then two days, boom, comes right back up. And if they get 14 days of sedentary delay and then a two-day reactivating exercise, they can't do it. And so that really suggested that there's a, a molecular memory window. So the, we, we hypothesize that the epigenome is encoding this information from the early exercise. It's holding on to that information for a duration of somewhere between one and two weeks and can be recaptured so the chromatin's open, we presume, or primed, we're not really sure, and that two days then re-engages. And that was extraordinarily similar to what yeast geneticists had demonstrated for food source um, and how yeast outcompete other yeast when they've been previously exposed to a food source. So it was, it was really cool to see. And a lot of this was influenced by work that Carl Kottman and Nicole Birchold had done uh, with these different parameters that we adopted from them. Um, some people argue, ah, you put a mouse into a running wheel. Well, they love it in the wild, too. You put a, a running wheel out in the wild, they'll go in, rats will go in, frogs will go in, voles will go in, mole, uh, you, you name it, they go in there, even snails. Um, and, and humans have even been observed to do this. They, they, they tend to stack running machines smack next to each other and run as fast as they can nowhere. Um, so apparently all brains like this. And so then we looked at these different parameters um, on synaptic plasticity. So we ran through these different parameters. Um, they go through sub-threshold uh, learning. And then an hour later, we look at LTP, again, done by any. And you can see that with two weeks of exercise, you get this really nice boost in LTP. This is theta burst LTP in, in the dorsal hippocampus. Um, with a week delay or a week delay plus two days, it's still enhanced. So that didn't match our behavior. We still don't know why. Um, but 14 delay uh, brings it all the way back down. And, and you can get a little bit of that back with two days. And so it roughly paralleled what we saw, uh, but not exactly. And uh, all of this works in females as well. This is Treed, uh, who was um, an undergrad and lab technician. He's now a graduate student at Mount Sinai. And, and so then again, we turned to RNA-seq. So we did a ridiculous experiment where we took all these different groups, ran them through the different exercise and delays and reactivating, put them through sub-threshold learning, and an hour later, uh, uh, sacked them, took out the dorsal hippocampus during the memory consolidation period, and did a bunch of RNA-seq. This is with Pierre Baldi. Um, and uh, he tends to take a Bayesian approach to this without FDR cutoff and linear regression models. Um, you can do it either way, but uh, this is, that's the way he does it. And we asked, okay, well, again, we ended up with such variable data, it was chaos, but we, again, constrained the question, what genes go up after exercise, come down with the delay, the sedentary delay, and then get kicked back on with that two days of exercise. And that led to 21 genes, and we were really happy to see BDNF because Carl Kottman's lab had already demonstrated that BDNF should be there and in their experiments, both at the RNA and protein level. And Ashley, in, in those 21 genes, identified ACVR1C, which I'd never heard of, but she got really excited about this, uh, this gene, ACVR1C. And this was just replication uh, uh, in other sets. And so I just want to take pause here for, uh, to talk about Carl. Uh, he, he was one of the uh, labs that kind of pioneered the idea that exercise can release neurotrophins in the brain. And this is um, a, uh, I can't read, what does that say, nature or science? Nature. Nature paper. One figure, one rat, one slice. <laughs> Extraordinary. <laughs> and uh, he showed that 
uh, 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 two or three weeks, I can't remember, of a rat running releases BDNF. And, and so they went on to pursue this, trying to understand, okay, well, what happens with alternating days? What happens with alternating days of, of, of delay? Uh, and, and that really formed the basis of what we used in, in our experiments with, in, in collaboration with his lab. So I just wanted to give the, them full credit for that. Um, what about ACVR1C? This is a really cool uh, uh, receptor um, in the TGF beta signaling cascade. And it, it's involved in regulating these um, SMAD proteins that then can form these really cool combinatorial um, protein complexes that can turn on gene expression or repress gene expression. So they can really integrate different signaling cascades and information and give you a nice output. And Ashley picked on ACVR1C because there was uh, literature indicating that the SMADs and those protein complexes then coordinate with CBP and the HDACs, which we love. So it was a great target. Um, but it turned out we didn't really know anything about ACVR1C in, in learning and memory. And so she first made a kinase dead mutant, uh, expressed it in the dorsal hippocampus with AAV, put the animals through 10 minute OLM acquisition, and then we did LTP. And so there you can see it demolishes long-term memory and reduces LTP. If you do the opposite, overexpress wild type ACVR1C in a virus, you enhance memory and you enhance LTP. And so it looked like ACVR1C could bidirectionally regulate uh, synaptic plasticity and memory in the adult brain. And, but does it hold the key to understanding how exercise is being integrated into kind of this epigenetic memory that then can persist? Because we still don't understand how that happens. And so that's gonna take an insane amount of uh, chromatin immunoprecipitation studies, which we've only just begun, uh, just absolutely brutal, uh, brute force molecular biology to do this, um, at, and I'll explain in a minute. And so we're really trying to understand, okay, what are the SMADs involved? How does CBP get involved? We know HDAC3 is regulating ACVR1C, but how is this happening? This is just a little flavor. This is from Dina Mateos, project scientist in the lab. Um, and she looked at uh, H3K27 methylation or acetylation. And this is a, a site, it's a lysine residue on the histone tail that can be um, modified in either way. And so that ratio starts to become really cool with respect to gene repression or gene expression. And so with exercise, we see that ratio start to drop. So exercise is opening up and priming um, um, the, the chromatin at the promoter of ACVR1C. And then we looked at another one, H3K9. This is a really another interesting modification, again, with this, this kind of bivalent regulation. And then we start to see some interesting patterns. And we're still trying to interpret what these patterns mean. They don't completely correlate with gene expression, but that's the beauty of the epigenome. It is massively complex. I mean, we could probably spend another 20 years trying to figure this out, um, and we probably will. But this is the first step. Um, then Ashley took it into the aging brain. What is happening in the aging brain? Uh, we knew from Janine's uh, experiment here that a focal deletion could enhance memory, and we had the RNA-seq. So Ashley went back to that RNA-seq. ACVR1C is enhanced in the focal deletion of HDAC3. So that suggested that HDAC3 is regulating ACVR1C. She saw that SMAD3, an activator, is increased. SMAD6, a repressor, is depressed. And she further showed that using chip qPCR, that HDAC3 is physically on the promoter of ACVR1C. It starts to come off during memory consolidation. And it seemed maybe, you know, there are no statistics here, but um, maybe there's a little bit more loaded on in the aging brain and it doesn't come off as much in the aging brain. So we're still looking at that. Um, it, but it was very clear that in the aging brain, ACVR1C is dropping, uh, both in mice and in humans. And this is data from Model AD at UCI that is, um, it's a U54 grant to examine or develop new late onset mouse models of Alzheimer's, but there's a lot of wild type RNA-seq data a lot of that data is starting to become publicly available um, so anyone can have access to it. That's the point of that, that grant. And so we looked at their data and you can see this steady decline in ACAVR1C. Maybe 
exacerbated in the, in the AD mouse model, um, the 5XFAD mouse model, but that's just kind of, I don't know about that. Um, the, uh, so what Ashley did is she took uh, ACVR1C, uh, overexpressed it in the aged animals, and you see a nice enhancement in, in long-term memory and uh, plasticity. And these are 18-month-old uh, mice. She then, uh, we got some 18-month-old 5XFAD, and if anyone's ever worked with these animals, um, they have horrendous uh, LTP, can't learn anything. Uh, they're barely alive uh, at 18 months. It's hard to get 18-month-old 5XFAD. And she was able to kind of reconfigure our surgery prep and uh, keeping them warm, et cetera, all these little adjustments. And boom, ACVR1C dramatically brings up LTP in an 18-month-old 5XFAD where you can see the LTP is just crashing back down to baseline. So that, that was kind of amazing. Um, but we couldn't do any behavior in those animals. They were just too old. So she got some 12-month-old um, 5XFAD, and here you can see an enhancement in object location memory uh, that correlated with an increase in, in LTP. So that led to this kind of model that she's been uh, developing on how um, ACVR1C can be engage these signaling cascades that come down through the SMADs and then auto-regulate ACVR1C that comes back and then starts to this, this kind of feedback mechanism that is likely pretty altered in the aging brain and in the context of, of AD. And, and that's, again, hands off. Uh, that's going to be uh, her, her lab soon. And she has a poster this afternoon to, if you want to uh, ask her better questions than, than I can answer. Um, the, because I'm not going to work on that anymore, that's hers. Um, I had to find something new to work on and the story of my life and it, it keeps, keeps the lab interesting. Um, so what other secrets did the RNA-seq hold? And here, my count my end time. Okay, still okay. Uh, this is close to the end. Um, what other secrets did the RNA-seq hold? And here I was heavily influenced by Philip Muse. Uh, he's a, a friend and colleague I've known since uh, he started graduate school. And he published these papers with uh, Shelley Berger at Penn when he was a graduate student, and, and then um, now he's a postdoc with uh, Eric Nessler at Mount Sinai, and really pioneering this approach to understand how um, uh, the acetyl-CoA pool is being used uh, for histone acetylation, which is really cool, taking the kind of cellular metabolism and, and energetics to the epigenome. And, and that was very complicated to kind of pull apart, and, and he did an amazing job of that. Um, he pulled us into it uh, on, with this study, and um, it, it just really started to change how I thought about acetyl-CoA metabolism, and because that was always an interesting idea because every histone modification is a metabolite. So there was always this beautiful interface of the epigenome and the metabolism, but uh, they were really able to kind of break through that uh, for the field. Um, so we went back into the RNA-seq and we said, well, we're, we're, doing, we're running exercise. We should be seeing some of these genes. And sure enough, we, we, we saw a lot of these acetyl-CoA metabolism genes in, in our data. And so that then led us to further enhance a, a hypothesis that we'd been working on for BDNF gene regulation. And so here... Um, I can't really point to it, but on, on the right side of the slide, you see this feedback mechanism. And, and that's something that we pieced together um, with Carl's um, lab through some really fun Zoom meetings during the pandemic when we couldn't get together. And so we would just get together and we would just talk about all sorts of stuff. And eventually this kind of feedback mechanism got drawn out on a, literally on a napkin and then started to really kind of solidify as a concept um, where these, this ratio of, of H3K9 methylation acetylation that I showed you earlier is affecting BDNF expression. BDNF then uh, guides the expression of SUV39, which is a histone modifying enzyme for methylation. And, and so that changes this repressive mark, which then comes back then to affect that ratio. And you get this beautiful little mechanism. Um, but we didn't know how that interfaced with anything. Uh, and so with, with 
thinking through this with Philip at different conferences and, um, you know, and, and Ashley identified that um, there are these ACC1, ACC2 enzymes that we could actually attack with this uh, compound nine um, that blocks these enzymes. And so here you can see ACC1, 2, and these enzymes uh, are involved in the carboxylation of acetyl-CoA to produce mannyl-CoA. So ACC1, 2 depletes your acetyl-CoA pool. Um, ACSS2, which was what Philip Muse was working on, synthesizes acetyl-CoA. So he's working on one side of the coin, and we've kind of stumbled into the other side of that coin. Um, and so uh, we wanted to know, well, does exercise really affect acetyl-CoA in the hippocampus? Um, we tried different kits and things, and it was just atrocious. Uh, we teamed up with uh, Chosung uh, Young at UCI, uh, who does liquid chromatomics liquid chromatography mass spec, and you see this really nice increase uh, in acetyl-CoA in the hippocampus after exercise. So now we can track it. Um, Ashley put compound nine, which blocks ACC1-2, uh, uh, increases acetyl-CoA, delivered it into the dorsal hippocampus using cannula, gave animals a subthreshold learning, and you see this nice enhancement, but there was a performance effect. We saw that the animals don't explore the objects the same. Um, and though, although the exploration is less, uh, the memory is higher, but um, that gave us a little pause because we, we never see a performance effect that then can confound your interpretation of, of memory, right? Um, so we, we started looking, okay, well, how are ACC1 and 2 expressed in, in the brain? And ACC1 seems to be the more highly expressed enzyme. And so uh, Franklin Garcia, postdoc in the lab, um, uh, hit that with an siRNA. He's developed a couple of really cool siRNAs that target different parts of the transcript. And um, in panel C there, you can see a really nice increase um, in long-term memory in adult mice with subthreshold training. He's got a poster uh, on Sunday looking at Crest. Crest is an incredible transcriptional regulator. It is one of the only transcriptional regulators that directly uh, binds CBP for histone acetylation and BRG1 for nucleosome remodeling. So it integrates the two most major epigenetic mechanisms all by itself. And that has been a tough nut to crack. And, and um, Franklin's done an incredible job uh, breaking that open. He's got really exciting data, uh, a poster on Sunday. And so he also got uh, ACC1 flox mice, made a focal deletion, got really nice enhanced memory there. And so then Again, we turn to the aging brain, and you can see these kind of energetic mechanisms start to decline. Tons of people have, have observed that. Um, here he showed data uh, with these, the three main enzymes that we're looking at. And in the aging brain, if he uh, 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 reduces expression of ACC1, you get an enhancement in, in memory. And so that was uh, really cool. So now, current directions, we are still working, trying to figure out how exercise creates this kind of epigenetic molecular memory that you can observe in yeast so easily and so beautifully. In a behaving mouse, it's been so much more difficult, but we're gonna keep at it. And then really this interface of metabolism and epigenetics and how the two crosstalk to alter how we encode information into long-term memory. How does that get altered in the aging brain? How is it exacerbated in, in the context of AD? Um, there are lots of different directions in the lab. Uh, we're recruiting, so if you're interested, let me know. Um, and I want to really thank the lab. It's a, it's a beautiful culture, uh, beautiful community, uh, both in the lab uh, and at UCI and the CNLM. And um, just terrific people. Thank you all for working on it. And lastly, since I have the podium and I have you, I, I discovered yesterday in my 300 email that I got yesterday um, that Christy Fowler was promoted a full professor. <laughs> Congratulations, Christy. Uh, we found, well, Liz Crastle, I don't know if Liz is here, but Liz, are you here? I saw you yesterday. Liz Crastle got promoted to tenure, so she's now an associate professor.
And the other one that just came in last night was Yuri Lur. He can't make it because he's teaching like two courses at the same time. And uh, I texted him last night. I'm like, where are you? And, and he said, I can't make it. I'm teaching too much right now. Uh, but he also just got promoted to tenure, uh, uh, associate professor with tenure. So um, this is great. So with that, thank you all. I'll take any questions. Thanks.